I will be giving a speech on neurolinguistic programming today. If for some reason someone conned you into coming here thinking that you'd be learning about some really neat coding techniques, I won't be teaching you that. However, what I will be teaching you about, hopefully, is to stop being a socially introverted nitwit, like myself. It probably, it probably won't happen, but hopefully I will teach you all, if you have such a problem, to stop being such a socially introverted nitwit. Lots of geeks seem to have that problem, and I personally feel that it is necessary to have communication skills as well as leap tech skills. And um, some of the things that I'm going to be talking about today are going to probably help you out in that aspect, but in other aspects, they're also going to help you with communication with yourself. Hopefully, anyway. I mean, you have to know yourself to communicate with yourself. So, I have a couple announcements to make. And um, the next session in this room is Dr. Walter C. Dog on how to crack RS. And this is the miscellaneous track, in case you're wondering. And also, this year's conference is being recorded on video and audio CD-ROM, state of the art. Huh? The recordings may be purchased at the recording sales desk located in the foyer. So, basically, I've got a bunch of hardware to give away up here today. So whoever wants some of this hardware, I'll give it to you. Anyone? Huh? Huh? Who wants some? Huh? Huh? Did you say you wanted the what? Okay, the Vax is yours. Anyone? Huh? Sun? Huh? You want the sun? Yeah? There you go. Anybody? Huh? Who wants this? It's more goth than me. Huh? Huh? Yeah, I think it's um, a pile of junk. Huh? It weighs a lot. Huh? You can ship it back, back and forth places. Okay. Yeah. I heard that someone did that and charged it to Pete Shipley's room. Was that you? So how did it get here? Do you know? Okay. So, yeah, at the end of the talk, feel free to come up here and take this equipment that isn't mine. Um, um, this uh, apparently some of it, the sun stuff was donated by Bodoman, and uh, the other stuff I can't tell you who was donated by because Agent X has terrible handwriting. But thank you, whoever you are. So basically today I'm going to start off with a brief history of neurolinguistic programming. And essentially it was started in the early 70s at UC Santa Cruz by two doctors, one of information science and the other a linguist, specifically Richard Bandler and John Grinder. And basically the principles that they wanted to start off with in order to come to a greater understanding of the communication between humans was based on the paradigm of duplication. They wanted to be able to see how an effective speaker, clearly not me, could go out and could influence a crowd. And in influencing that crowd, they would be able to maybe control someone to raise their hand, maybe to get them to stop being afraid of heights, perhaps to get that girl at that club that you think is really, really sexy. Maybe it's not a crowd, maybe it's one person, maybe it's just yourself, right? Well, essentially, they wanted to be able to control that and they wanted to be able to duplicate the effectiveness. So they would take a model of that person, say that successful person, what they're doing and how they're doing it in order to achieve the effectiveness of their speech, of their body language, of all, all of their aesthetic. And essentially, it works to some extent, although some would argue that it's a pseudoscience, although others would argue that it's not. It, it really depends on who you ask. Sorry, yeah. Some would argue that it is simply a pseudoscience, although others would argue that it's not a pseudoscience at all. Um, I'm not going to give you my opinion on that, really, because, well, I'm not qualified to speak on the subject. But, uh, <laughs> just kidding. So, um, yeah. So, this, of course, this entire paradigm is nothing new, and people have been conning the shit out of each other for years and years, you know? Like, when you say something to me, and you, you think it's really, really important to me to make eye contact, of course, if I want to be an effective communicator with you, I probably want to make eye contact with you. And if you are always thinking about memories by accessing a certain part of your brain and giving the, uh, the eye pattern of accessing the memory part of your brain, which is... We'll, we'll get into that later. I probably want to be doing the same thing. If you have a speech impediment, or if you're from the South, so sorry, I'm mutually exclusive there, but, uh, um, and I want to effectively communicate with you, chances are I'm going to want to mimic your speech patterns. I'm going to want to, mem like, to mimic 
all of the semantics that you have to make you feel more comfortable with me, so that you'll trust me, so that you'll, so that you'll want to communicate what I want from you, so that you'll listen to what I have to say and you'll really think I'm actually saying something, when in fact I might not be, or maybe I am, we'll see. So, how many of you here have read Snow Crash? Any of you? None of you have read Snow Crash? I'm really surprised by this, at a hacker convention. Yeah, okay, sorry, yeah. I'm just doing that to bother you, to aggravate. No, I'm serious. It's working, too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's good to know that some of you are familiar with Snow Crash. Of course, how many of you have seen the movie Magnolia? Huh? Yeah? Magnolia. Have you seen it? Huh? Okay, so you know that Tom Cruise character? He's a total asshole. Everybody fucking hates that guy. He just, He's just horrible. He's horrible. He's like the worst human on the planet. But he's a really motivational speaker. And uh, you have to respect how he does that. Well, see, how he does that, in so many words, is basically a neurolinguistic programming technique. And what you want to be able to do, if you want to be an effective speaker like him, unlike me, you probably want to start to model yourself after certain people and to do certain things. Like, if you wanted to be... Let's go with this, because I think that there are a lot of guys in here who probably have never had sex, right? Any of you? Huh? You, sir? Hey! Oh! I touched on a soft spot there, sorry. Yeah, huh? Huh? Woo. Come see me later. Yeah. Alright, that will be my first with uh, the uh, geriatric crowd. Alright, um, so... <laughs> No offense. Um, so basically, some, some other pop culture references. Uh, you know the sleazy guy at every club that you go to? Every single one? He's the one that's the first to buy you a drink? He's the one that has the uh, condom in his back pocket? You know, that guy? Him? Well, he also is an effective neurolinguistic programmer. Whether or not he actually knows it is a completely different matter. You see, because whether or not you have someone who's a con man, or someone who's an effective communicator, or someone who's a salesman trying to sell you something, right? You want to, say you really don't want to buy a refrigerator, or you really don't want this piece of junk switch up here, but I'm going to convince you that you want it. And the reason is because I'm using these techniques. Some people pick up on them naturally, and other people do not pick, on, pick up on them at all, and as a result, they end up getting uh, taken advantage of, or... Yes, you know, I really do love you, baby. If you know what I mean, you know? So, anyway, the point being is that some of the techniques that I'm going to teach you today, or hopefully attempt to explain to you, um, you're going to pick up on this. You'll be able to recognize it when you walk down the street. Um, you'll be able to, hopefully, if you have any phobias, you know, this is kind of a tall order here. If you have some phobias, maybe you're afraid of jerking it in public. You, sir? Yeah. All right. Well, if the, all right. So maybe I can get you over that, right? Because essentially, all it is that's holding you back from being able to do what you want to do is really your own willpower to do it. If you're truly interested in doing something, you can achieve it, especially when it comes to yourself. And so, all in all, all in all, if you'd like to be able to better yourself and to social engineer AT&T's phone switch passwords, uh, I don't know, pick up girls, whatever you might very well want to do with yourself, NLP can be very effective. But like I said, a lot of people think it's bullshit, and just, I partially think some of it's bullshit, but a lot of it's pretty good. Yeah. Interesting techniques. So, so, basically, a really important part of neurolinguistic programming, ironically, is the study of non-linguistic body patterns, right? Such as gestures and facial expressions as a, a system um, of communication between people. For instance, if, you, if you're talking about a highly traumatic subject with someone and you want that person to associate that highly traumatic ordeal with something that is remote and distant and removed from yourself but yet still within your control, so say you're talking to someone who was recently beat up by someone, say punched in the face by the pool, right? So let's just take that, right? And let's say that right there, that is the object that you're going to try when you're talking to the person, and you're going to make this that bad memory. You're going to tell them, you're going to tell them that 
it's really bad. It's really bad what happened to you. I feel terrible about what's going on. But I can help you. Because in reality, there are other things that can help you. you know? and, and, you can, and you can go on and you can begin to essentially, in so many words and so many gestures, begin to create a system of trust without actually ever asking for their trust. And as such, you can associate these bad things and these good things, and you can gain a level of trust where 10 minutes later, maybe they'll be telling you the story of their life. Or you'll be leaving? You never know. So, so essentially, no linguistic programming, as I'm sure you've picked up, has nothing to do with Visual Basic, right? So, to break it down into sections and to find what each word means in the context that I'm presenting it, I'll be formal and I'll be subjective. And to be formal, the study of the structure of subjective experience. For instance, to have this subjective experience where I'm trying to project that one object is bad and one object is good, that would be an example of neurolinguistic programming in action. However, we can also be subjective and we can break it down into other things. And we can include we can include all sorts of things from body language to speech to you know clothing to coloring to everything under the sun that could possibly invoke emotion and could also create a mode of communication that is unlike anything most people realize is actually going on. So the neuro-linguistic part of it, we'll break it down and we'll say neuro, which is the understanding of the interaction of the mind and of the body. Psychology and kin kinesiology, I believe would be the correct term. And the linguistic part would be where you need to maintain an active listening state with special attention to the rapport. Because what you want to be able to do is be able to mirror them, but don't make them think that you're making fun of them, because you'll really, really piss them off. You know, if you've got some guy who's got twang and he's from the south, you probably don't want to start talking like, you know, you've got, you know, making fun of the guy. Anyway, it, it happens, you will get struck in the face repeatedly for this if you, if you make fun of them. And, uh, yeah, I know this from experience. And so the programming part, which is pretty misleading to most people, is that they think it's some sort of API call, you know, like I'm going to be able to reach into your brain and I'm going to be able to move things around. Well, in fact, it's not so much of an API, but it's a program of things that you run through, right? Think of it as like a batch file that you do with yourself, right? Say you want to give a speech at DEF CON, right? So you need to run through all of the things you would normally need to do in order to give that speech. And you need to be especially convincing that you know what you're doing, you know what you're talking about, et cetera, et cetera, like the AppleScript guy and myself. And um, so if you were to say, stop being afraid of heights one day, it would probably be because of some change you made in your life, either in some perspective that you changed or in some act that you changed that in some way, shape, or form went on to later affect your subconscious or the subconscious of those around you. For instance, I'm terribly afraid of heights. And I've been trying to get over this for years and years and years. And uh, just to show you how effective I am at NLP, I'm still afraid of heights. So essentially, overall, the best thing to do would be to sort of ease yourself in or to throw yourself in to situations where you would need to not be afraid of heights. I mean, for myself, I took myself to the tallest freestanding building in the world and tried to stand on a glass floor. And that would be the throwing yourself in part, and it didn't work out so well. Although easing yourself in, you know, standing on a chair, you know, and maybe looking down, kind of, kind of afraid, you know, th that, that, you know, that's a good way to start, right? So, anyway. Basically, another aspect of NLP is the gathering of data for modeling, right? Say there's a successful person that you really, really want to be like, like that sleazy guy with the condom in his back pocket. You know, he picks up all the girls, you just don't know how he does it, right? I mean, how does he do it? Anyone have any ideas? I mean, he makes promises that he can't keep. He says things that aren't true, right? Have any of you guys ever run into this guy? You know what I'm talking about? Girls, especially? I'm sure you. Huh? Okay. So, and basically, you know, NLP is a common definition. It's happening again. The birds are back. Yeah, that's the point. I'm trying to, it's the aggravation of the 
Yeah. So, anyway, the linguistic technology that applies to all of this is essentially so that people can communicate, as I've said about 70 times so far. And the ability to communicate with a person that you want to gain something from is an extremely important thing because and I keep saying this over and over and over again because I can't stress enough, most people do not in any way, shape, or form have the ability to instantly hit it off with someone. But some people do. Even if they are that sleazy guy at the bar, he does possess a certain skill. That salesman who actually is your friend when you walk in, who, who's been able to read you from the second you walked in and knows how to act so that you don't suspect that he really isn't that way, that he really doesn't have a daughter that's interested in the same kind of soccer as your daughter. And yes, that's why this fridge is going to go well with your family unit, right? Right? So, anyway, one of the more important parts of NLP is how the academics have, in some way, shape, or form, been able to limit like minimalist reads of people. To be able to have a question that you can ask someone that's going to give off certain things about their brain, right? So if you were to, for some reason, ask someone about their favorite band, and you wanted them to think that you were interested in the same kind of music, you could come up with something where, regardless if it's true or not, it would, in some way, shape, or form, influence them to believe that you were, in some way, shape, or form, in the know about the subject. For instance, if you were talking about music with a good friend of yours that you had just met, I say good friend because what you're trying to do here is build rapport with them so that they're interested in what you have to say, and so at the same time as being interested, they begin to trust you and they become interested in you. So on the shallow teenager level, you probably want to talk about music, right? And so let's say they're interested in Radiohead, and they're just talking about Radiohead for some reason. Chances are, if you started to talk about Tom York and about dying in cars, they would be pretty interested and they would think that you knew something about Radiohead, which you may or may not know. But you could also make up some wild, crazy fact about Radiohead that isn't true. And depending on how long you want to, because there aren't many of those, but but just assume for a second that you wanted to make up some crazy fact. Depending on how long you want your lie to last and you want them to believe in this reality you're creating. You know, Steve Jobs, are you all familiar with him? You know, in his reality. Steve Jobs. Oh, oh. All right. Yeah. That would be uh, Strick from Yak.net. This is all funded by him. Thank you, Strick. So. Anyway, Steve Jobs in his reality distortion field, I don't know if you know this or not, but he's, he's taken NLP courses, right? Because he wants to be an effective salesman. He wants to be able to sell you piles and piles and piles of Macs that when you want to upgrade the video card, you throw the whole machine away, right? So anyway, his reality distortion field is something that each person here could possess, assuming that I could convey it to you. And considering that this is a speech about me communicating, it's probably an important topic there. So. Basically, you want to be able to run through the program that he's doing. When he's having his reality distortion field, he's convincing you that you really want to, to do something for him, that you really want to buy something from him. There is an advantage to something about Apple. Are you all familiar with this? And how somehow he sold Max to the world for 20 plus years? Are you? Are you familiar with Steve Jobs and his horrible cultish selling techniques? For instance, the Church of Scientology. You know, as I was talking about Tom, Tom Cruise earlier, I know we're all Scientology fans here, right? Because we hate free speech, right? Right? Okay. So they also use this NLP in most of their advertisements, right? Because they try and sell you this amazing, amazing thing over here. This thing. Yeah, come a little closer, give us more money. Over here is what, yeah, come here. And over here is what you're looking for, right? So they use NLP techniques. And essentially, what they'll do is they'll take Tom Cruise and they'll make him his, the poster boy for NL, NLP. And they'll say, if you want to be rich and famous like this guy, you just give us money, right? And, you know, essentially, it's not mutually exclusive to NLP, but they're con artists, right? And so it all falls into the same. And most people that have effective communications where they can allow you to do something you may or may not want to do, at the base of it, it is this. And so, as a result of that, you probably want me to get on with it already. Hold on a second. No. Okay. So, 
most people here probably aren't going to sit down and write a very, very long model about someone. We're probably not going to get into a conversation where you're going to allow me to model the successful things in your life. You're not going to let me sit down and say, hi, what is this in your life that is really important? What are these things? What do you feel about these subjects? When you are going about doing this amazing programming task, how do you get in the mood? Because you might start to feel uncomfortable, especially if you had no idea who I was, and you knew that I was using it for the nefarious purpose of being able to just take the good qualities in you and remove you, which would, of course, mean that I could remove that person, which is a positive thing, depending on who they are. Like myself, you probably want to get another speaker up here. So, anyway. Being a fed up tech support person, maybe any of you ever done tech support? Okay, you probably messed with the customers one or two times, right? Like said, the, oh, I know the problem. It's a, it's a problem between seat and keyboard, right? It's a seat and keyboard user error. Now you can fix that, just remove the error, right? So <clears throat> you're subtly, of course, making fun of them. And they, they, they may, they may or not, you know, maybe they'll realize it depending on how bright they are. Maybe if they're using their foot pedal correctly, you know? So, anyway, Mitnick, for instance, is also an amazingly good uh, NLP guy, minus the fact that he got arrested. Um, but he effectively uses NLP for social engineering, which is probably the one thing you're interested in, uh, if not the sexual aspects of being able to, you know, attract the opposite or same sex. And so, essentially, if you want, you can use these techniques in order to gain access to places you're not supposed to go. You know, the, the guy who walks into the party where someone, you know, the Ninja Network party story about last year, where apparently someone had some bad stuff happen to them. So they made it a, a, a special kind of party. You had to be invited and you had to have one of these stickers on your badge, right? So an effective uh, social engineering technique would of course be, oh yeah, I belong in that party. No, 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 that person over there, they, they'll vouch for me. And of course, eventually, out of a room of 40 people, someone's going to vouch for you. And all you really need to do is make sure that the person that you want to get to vouch for you is, of course, in some way, shape, or form comfortable with you. You know, smiling with them, mocking their gesture in a, a way that isn't going to offend them, but at the same time, they're going to feel comfortable with. It worked for me last night, and I got that sticker. And, uh, you know, and then I left. But, uh, Anyway, so I really, like I was saying, a salesman is a really effective NLP person because they will attempt in every way, shape, or form to relate their life to yours. If you've ever bought a car from someone, they will sit there and they will tell you about how their daughter, yeah, they, their daughter really enjoyed all the things that your daughter liked. And as you'll notice, since you care about what your daughter thinks, you'll care about what the salesman has to say. You'll care about the things that, in some way, shape, or form, allow him to get into your emotional life, that allow him to get into the subtleties of your purchasing decisions so that you, in some way, shape, or form, are able to be conned into buying something you don't need, don't want, can't possibly afford, and is completely useless. Like the bric-a-brac, break open and throw away. Yes, in fact, that is exactly what it is. What he asks is, is that mirroring? And the thing is, is that you have to, when mirroring someone, as it were, if you'd like to use that term, um, you really don't want to do it too much, though, because if they saw you, say, beforehand, they're going to, in some way, shape, or form, pick up on it. Because I'm sure you realize that when you have the presupposition of, I am this way, and this is the way that I've always been, you have to make sure that they've never seen you outside of that character. Because if they have, your cover's blown and you're in a lot of trouble. Certainly, you know, if you are the sysadmin who needs this network password, if they just saw you working at the 7-Eleven, you're not going to be able to pass that off very well. Even if you know your shit really well, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to pull it off. So, so there are some ways that you can look at a person and you can read what they're thinking. For instance, are their pupils dilated? What is their demeanor presenting? I mean, are they, are they leaning over? Are they grabbing their back? Are they, I mean, how is their hat tilted? Are they wearing contacts? What about them do you have in common with them? So that you can, in some way, shape, or form, become a very good friend of theirs. Someone who is worthy of trust. Someone who is worthy, in some way, shape, or form, of being able to conceivably communicate that, yes, you can trust me, but without saying that. Because if you actually have to say that, you're, you're going to fail horribly. 
So anyway, it's important to, of course, note where they focus their attention when you're talking about something. For instance, if you had something that was going to cause a distraction when you say a certain word, if you do it on a consistent basis, you can associate that distraction with that word and the feelings presented by that word. So if you wanted to talk to a rape victim about something, and this is an extreme case here, and you wanted to associate that rape victim and their, their entire thought process on the subject with something far-fetched and removed from you, maybe you'd be talking about something over there, maybe a salt shaker on the table. And you know, you'd start to talk later about how you really dislike that salt shaker. You know, it's a little extreme there, but you'd have to be talking about specifically something that's subtle enough to where you are sharing a dislike that is directly related to the object of your dislike as opposed to specifically the dislike of rape. Because that's not really effective, because who's going to say, no, I really enjoy rape, thank you, it's very good. Just, it won't happen. And they'll know that you're giving them the sympathy. And uh, in my opinion, although sympathy is a good thing, you're going to have a very difficult time convincing someone that you're genuine about it in a way that they're going to trust you. Yes? How, what? Specifically, when you associate the objects? Um, specifically, what it would be called, I believe, would be something along the lines of objectifying your belief, your specific uh, physical rapport with that object. The, the one word terminology is not on me right now, but yes? Is that to yes, it is related to anchoring. Thank you. That is the word that I was looking for. But so, anyway. Another really important thing to notice is a breathing pattern, right? Because a breathing pattern is a really important thing to notice. Because if you notice that there are some people who start to get panicked, like uh, say someone's social engineering you, right? And you think that they might be faking it. You could watch their voice tones change on the floor. You could hear their voice tones change. And you could also listen to their breathing patterns. Or if you could see them, you could see if they're sweating. You could see that perhaps they're nervous in some way, shape, or form. You can look at what they're wearing. What kind of shoes are they wearing? You know, you can tell a lot by a person's shoes, obviously, because of, well, where they're going, where they've been, and why are they wearing those particular shoes? Why would you wear $300 shoes to the beach and walk, walk into the ocean with them? What are you trying to present when you do such a thing? Are you trying to say that you're frivolous about money? Are you trying to say that you just don't care, that the experience of walking into the ocean is, is more important than money? Uh, I mean, it depends, right? So, essentially, voice cues, skin tone changes, and breathing patterns are considered minimal cues. But the most important minimal cue is eye patterns, right? So essentially what you want to want to be able to do is to read people's eye patterns. And, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but first I'm going to touch on the modeling process, right? So the modeling process is not based on, say, a theory, but a set process for modeling, right? It's the most important aspect of neurolinguistic programming because it is the means for discovery of the important elements of that person's success and or communication means and or anything about them that you wanted to discover because everything is an element, it's an object of that person that can be removed from that person. Whether or not it's how they look, to how they speak, in some way, shape, or form, you can give off the same feeling that it produces by changing your general rapport or by adding in certain things to them, like when anchoring, for instance, if you wanted to uh, change how they feel about certain objects and relate that to bad things, such as the salt shaker and the rape incident, you know, salt, rape, right? So what you'd want to be able to do there is to anchor those things. And as a result, you'd be able to change, say, how you feel about something. And indirectly, you can change how other few people feel about things. And if possible, you can create a change in them. And it is possible. But you can create a change in them that is based solely on the fact that you're talking about it and relating it to real world objects that they can handle on a, on a better level, right? Because some people can handle certain psychological traumas, but not others. And as a result, you can, of course, uh, change fundamental deep psychological trauma. Like when someone says they can't do something, it's only because they're stopping themselves from doing it. Of course, it's uh, obviously if it's like you can't jump the Grand Canyon with a skateboard, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about the psychological limitations. For instance, like, you know, I really, 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 
I can't play poker because I'm afraid the cards are going to eat me, right? I mean, it's not realistic, but I'm sure someone has got that phobia in the hospital somewhere. And as a result of having that phobia, it's probably going to lead them to have serious problems. But what you could do is you could lead them to believe that, in fact, the only reason that they have that phobia is because they themselves have something wrong. But rather than point out, you, sir, are wrong, what you probably want to do is lead them to believe this through simple patterns of, of basically communicating that they are doing things that they know are incorrect. For instance, if you were to question them a little bit about things they like and dislike and things they know are incorrect, like perhaps there's a dogma that they're vehemently opposed to, if you were to start to relate things that were related to that, eventually, over certain long periods of time, short periods of time, you can change people. It depends, of course, on what you're doing, whether you're retrieving a password or you're helping someone from recovering from the fear of heights, as I was talking about, right? You can change them. And so, anyway, so let's, let's, let's find a, a suitable model, right? And let's say you found someone who has a really excellent quality, right? But they have some serious mental problems, right? You obviously want to be able to model their correct quality, the, the, the quality that is essentially all that you want from them, the, the, the one, one thing that they have, as opposed to that one, two thing. And, um, that one particular quality they have, perhaps you think that they're an amazingly good um, social engineer, right? So you want to learn their techniques that they have. Of course, one of the best ways to do that is to question them subtly, and if they will allow you to, to question them in like an in-depth intensive study. So you can ask them all sorts of things about how they achieve their goals, and uh, of course, a good model for this is we'll say, let's say a guy named Jake is your subject, right? So let's find out how Jake does something in particular, right? Let's say he's highly skilled with the ladies, just as a step-by-step -step process of modeling here, right? If you were interested in some sort of relation with someone of the female sex, you probably want to begin your model with asking a lot of questions about what Jake does, what motivates him for doing it, and uh, what gets him slouched, you know, any question that might come to mind about it. And then you can begin to take on the characteristics of this Jake character, and it would allow you in some way, shape, or form to begin to be more effective, as it were, in this case, with the ladies. Because, as it just so happens, there are probably a lot of people that aren't very good at conversing with people, and I don't mean necessarily sexually, but they have nervous tensions as a result of, uh, in some way, shape, or form, when they were a little kid, they had traumas or something like that. But, so what you'd want to be able to do, using these uh, modeling techniques of someone who's just a little bit better and more confident in themselves, you would be able to gain this confidence sort of by proxy, by taking that one characteristic away from them, by knowing that when they're walking somewhere, in some way, shape, or form, here. Okay, so, as I was saying, if for some reason you wanted to model this particular person, and you wanted to gain that specific skill, and you wanted to be able to, in some way, shape, or form, communicate freely with someone of either the opposite sex or the same sex or something along these lines, I focus a lot on sex because it seems to get more people's interest than, I don't know, some obscure other thing. Everybody has this in common. So, basically, you want to model them, and the best way to model them is by asking questions. If you want, you could ask the person next to you, just, just for a second, take a, take, take a few minutes actually, to ask the person next to you a lot of questions, right? Ask them specifically what it is that they do, things that make them feel comfortable. Watch their eye movements. See if you pick up on something. For instance, if you know the person and they're lying to you, watch which direction their eyes move in, right? So you can understand a little bit better about which part of their brain they're accessing, which I'll get into shortly. And so, if you want, is anyone adverse to this, uh, to understanding the person you're sitting next to at all? Get to know the person next to you, just for a moment? Ask them some questions? Any? Yeah. Just talk amongst yourselves for a moment here. Right? Okay, 
So, hopefully you've gotten to know the person next to you very well in the last 30 seconds. Yeah, specifically like iPad or TSM actually. So, so let's just say for a second you knew the person or you, you didn't know the person, right? Well, certain questions that you're going to be asking are not going to be answered in an honest fashion because either the subject will not feel comfortable with the trashy answer or because certain observations can't always be made by oneself. Thus, the solution, of course, is to, to observe that person in their natural environment, right? And this will lead you to better questions, and in turn, you can lead to models that are more effective, and therefore, you can apply for use in other people, because essentially what you're trying to do is extract those wonderful qualities and leave out everything else. So, basically, what we'd like to do here is, is some sort of truth maintenance, if, if you will. And basically, the truth maintenance comes in by observing them in their natural, in their natural habitat, as it were. And at the same time as, as, uh, as observing them in their natural habitat, you probably want to, in some way, shape, or form, not let them know that you're observing them. For instance, it would be difficult to take someone from the audience here and convince them of several different things just based only on the fact that they know that my speech is about convincing things and reading people and modeling people. So it, if they're voluntary about it, it might not be completely honest. And uh, this is where the profiling comes in, where you want to be able to read someone from a distance, or perhaps you want to be able to read someone that you're very close to that you think is not necessarily always honest. So a really important part of NLP also is presupposition, right? With the use of presuppositions, you're able to give suggestions that will lead the subject to your conversation direction that you'd like to go in. Um, let's say the sentence, and as you were saying, cheers, now drink up, and handing a person a drink, and then having them mimic the drinking motion that you are doing, say, last two nights ago or something along those lines. And there's a guy in the hallway, and we we're having a beer. He was really, really drunk, and he was telling me he just couldn't possibly drink anymore. And it was funny because I, I, asked, him to hold, I asked him to hold a cup of absinthe for me, and he, he said, no problem, I'll hold this cup of absinthe, but there's just no way that I could possibly drink it. I mean, I'm absolutely against drinking this absinthe. I've had way too much to drink already tonight. I, I can barely even see. I can, I can hardly walk. And I was like, all right, all right, I understand. No peer pressure whatsoever. And, and I was just having fun with the guy because, well, he was annoying me. And I was trying to write this really well-written speech. As you can say, he clearly distracted me. Um, so... I said cheers, you know, smiled, gave him a pat on the shoulder. I was affirming that, in fact, what I wanted him to do would be in his best interest. That he would be content in some way, shape, or form with doing exactly what it is that I want, but without him realizing that I'm doing this. So I made the presupposition that the happy friend of mine would be holding my drink, right? And then I made another presupposition with my body language that, that in fact, it was nice of him to say cheers to me. And absolutely, cheers right back at you, even though he didn't remember saying this, of course. Cheers, clink glasses, and down it. And so he drank a half a glass of absinthe, right? Right? So that's a good example of, you know, NLP at work, right? Um, anyway, so it's actually, it's, it's, it's pretty conducive to be able to use your body language effectively like that because that's, that's an example where linguistics wouldn't have really been able to do it on its own, where there's someone who's so vehemently opposed to a certain thing. You know, when you say, have a drink, they really don't want a drink. But you know that they want that root hypnol, right? So just say for a second, they're vehemently opposed to it. They're putting up this wall and they're saying to you, no, I don't want it. No, so just stop saying that. So, of course, the best line of attack is to go around the wall and is to give it to them in such a way that you lead them into a motion where they will continue the motion, where you will lead them into doing something. For instance, if you were to call up tech support and, you know, be disconnected, right? Yeah, I was just talking to such and such and this and that. I just confirmed all this stuff and I just wanted to make sure that I got my password correctly. He read it off as so and so and such and such and these characters, but my phone was breaking up and I'm driving through the desert right now and, well, you know, I need my password because once I get to this hotel, I'm only going to be able to dial up in this way, shape, or form, and so on and so forth. And you give the presupposition that you've already called up, you've already authenticated, that you in some way, shape, or form really are a valid user, right? 
So it can be useful for that as well. Of course, these aren't exactly the successful modeling techniques, but rather just the ability to do a cold read on someone, the ability to just look at someone and to know that, for instance, if you were to see a Klansman, you'd probably know that if you're Jewish, you shouldn't be uh, near that guy, right? I mean, there are certain things that are obvious, and then there are certain things that are not obvious, like if you uh, were to come to the yak.net room for the hot tub, right? Maybe you didn't know that there was no yak.net hot tub. But you never know. Some people bought it. Some people didn't. So, but I assure you, they were all naked. So, they were. They really were. The police were hassling them. They, you can't be naked in the pool. I said, hey, you guys, I know where there's a place without any police at all. It was that guy, actually. And, uh, and uh, something about, ah, uh, you've never seen attractive women. If they were attractive, I wouldn't harass them to get out of the pool. Okay, so I said, come on now. Come with me. I know where there's a great pool, right? It's awesome. There's a hot tub in the acro. I mean, the bathtub has jets, right? So a hot tub, maybe, of some sort. <laughs> so anyway, convincing them in some way, shape, or form that you really have something that they want that in some way you can give it to them when in fact as long as what you want is going to be had before they realize you're duping them it can be effective so anyway a really important um, thing to neuro linguistic programming which i think is actually probably like the fourth most important thing to neuro linguistic programming is eye patterns it's also one of the most controversial discoveries with relation to nlp because a lot of people think that it's not necessarily a good thing to base it on because if you're left-handed, it can be reversed. If you're ambidextrous, you know, you're somewhere in between. Apparently, if you're from a certain country in South Africa, it's reversed regardless of which side your hand is on, and, and so on and so forth, right? So the micro-movement of the eye, though, is, is generally unconscious. Like, uh, and... If, if, if I were to tell you something and uh, you thought it was bullshit, perhaps you'd dart your eye in a, in a, certain, uh, a certain direction, right? If perhaps you had the feelings of absolute hatred for me, perhaps, perhaps angst, you might look down and to the right and you might think, you know, you were kind of sad. I mean, I'm sure that you've associated these things with people before, right? When you have a conversation with them and... You, you notice the direction that they hang their head, the direction in which their eyes move, how they droop their hands, how they uh, tip their hat, so on and so forth. So just as a, a general refresher on here, if your eyes are up and to the left, that's the non-dominant hemisphere visualization. In other words, things that you're trying to remember, right? So when you're talking to a police officer and he says, do you work at this company? And who is your boss? You probably, since many police officers are trained with uh, micro eye movement patterns, you probably want to look up and to the left because you'd be accessing memory. It would probably be a very, very bad idea, however, to look over and look at the creative section and start talking about, say, oh, my boss is so-and-so and, -so and uh, because if they are trained, and many are, they're going to know you're totally full of shit and you're going to get in a lot of trouble. And it's happened to a lot of people. And uh, you need to be able to lie with your entire body. So you have to be conscious of things that are so minuscule as your eye patterns. So it's really important to be able to control that, however. So up and to the right is the dominant hemisphere of visualization. In other words, constructed imagery, visual you know, fantasy. So you'd be thinking to yourself, yes, my boss is... Yes, it's, uh, it's uh, Doctor Who, right? Yeah, maybe that wouldn't work so well if they were actually trained because they'd know that you're full of shit. And some people would and some people wouldn't. But what you can also pick up on this is when you're talking to someone and they look up and to the right, you know that they are full of shit, generally. And it's true. And it works. A ask a good friend of yours something after the talk. Something you know is absolutely untrue in some way, shape, or form and see how they answer. Get them to try and lie about it, but catch them off guard, right? So that they know what they're supposed to say, but their body doesn't always respond in the correct manner. So if your eyes are laterally left, it's the non-dominant hemisphere for audio processing. You know, remembering sounds, words, tape loops, tonal discrimination, stuff like that. 
If your eyes are lateral to the right, it's the dominant hemisphere audio processing for remembered sounds and words, right? Or rather, uh, remembered sounds and words. So if your eyes are down and to the left, it's internal dialogue, right? Yeah. Generally, when you're talking to yourself, you're thinking like, oh shit, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? If you really want to mess with people that are reading into this, change this around. Do not follow these default patterns. These are well-known patterns. And if you can change these, and people are reading them, they'll throw you off. Business people, if you, if you sell products to someone in some way, shape, or form, it's good to know specifically which patterns people are looking for because these patterns are taught at business seminars, which I'm not really going to get into, but I think that seminars are kind of a waste of time. And if you pay for it, you're wasting your money. Nothing you can find in a book. Talk to someone who's actually wasting money on, et cetera. So, you probably want to change those around. I highly recommend, if you're changing them around though, to be constant. Because you want to be able to make it so that when you are doing your eye patterns, people don't realize that you're messing with them. Because it's important to keep this cover. You, if, you don't, if you don't have this, this entire alternate identity of the self that is subconscious when people are reading into it, like I said, they're going to be not fooled in any way, shape, or form. They're going to know that you're lying to them, and they're going to be able to know that you are manipulating them. And even if they don't know about NLP, they might just be intuitive, because these things aren't so difficult. I mean, when you're lying, some people get that, that smile, you know, they, they get a little red-faced, they sort of slip up in their talk, you know, the, oh, the tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And anyway, so, eyes down and to the right. I think this is a good one because it's one that most people are familiar with. Feelings, right? It's, it's, it's something that, that everybody in here, unless you're the most cold-hearted of person, will feel, right? So, when you're talking with someone about how they feel about something, like in some way, you're, you're talking to someone about a traumatic experience, and you don't necessarily believe they had this traumatic experience, perhaps the correct thing to do it would be to watch their eyes and to see if when talking about this they're looking into the uh, remembered imagery of up into the left and if they're also looking down into the right because they remember actually feeling this pain, right? Because, like I said, if they're, of course, looking up into the right and they're not wavering from that really other than to look right back at you, you probably know that they're lying to you. So, if they're looking uh, straight ahead but they're defocused, you've got dilated eyes perhaps, it's pretty much access to almost any sensory information, but it's usually visual, obviously, because you're looking right at something, right? So, one of the things that's interesting about that, of course, is that most people, when they're trying to control their eye patterns, is they just look straight ahead. Which, although that is effective, it isn't necessarily the correct thing to do, because by looking straight ahead and not having these eye patterns be present, if someone is paying attention to them, they may begin to pick up on the fact that you are not being honest, either with yourself or with them. So basically, these patterns hold true, as I said, for the Western Hemisphere and people who are right-handed. I mean, that's where most of the extensive studies have been done. As where left-handed people tend to be mirror images of those that are right-handed, which I'm sure some of you have noticed, you know, the eye patterns would be different for those people, as, and so on for everyone else in between, as I've already said. Right? So depending on the orientation of the person, uh, whether or not they're uh, oriented in some direction, more, more of a physical, more of an emotional orientation, they might access certain parts of their brain more frequently than that of someone who is, in some way, more associated with, say, emotions as opposed to physical contact, right? And so those people are going to mislead you, maybe not even intentionally, because they're going to be talking about basically one thing, and you'll think that they're in some way, shape, or form accessing memory imagery, but in, in fact, they might just be dominant about always thinking about this type of the past. They're always, they're always thinking of the past, and, and, and it's important, of course, to remember that if this is so, that you can't always be able to read someone right off the bat because they might be more dominant. And pretty much everybody is more dominant. Yes? Oh, okay. 
Yeah. Okay. So once you become more comfortable with your ability to read someone's eye patterns, you can begin to adapt questions which will elicit certain verbal responses. And they're socially dictated, but they also might elicit an unconscious twitch, you know, a little bit of hatred, you know, so it depends, you know. Just a dart of the eyes is enough to be able to tell something about someone because they're slipping up. Not necessarily always, but it does happen, and you can read people, and when you're reading them, you'll be able to gain insight into them. But you have to, in some way, shape, or form, trick them in order to do it. So, it's really important when you're making a deal with someone, I'm sure you realize, right, is to be able to, to read their underlying thought process, because you want to know if he's really going to go 20 bucks lower, or something along those lines. So, you want to be able to read their eye patterns once again, because this is going to lead to that. So, anyway, if you want to find someone's primary representation of what that particular model that they stand for, be it visual or physical, ask them something like, what do you highly value? What is really important to you? And when they go to answer, the direction that their eyes will, will dart is generally and not always, but it is generally the one that in some way relates to them at the inner core of their being. So, anyway, when a police officer is asking you a question, be sure to look to your, to your left, assuming you're right-handed, as uh, this would dictate to the officer that you're accessing memory, right? If you want to remember what actually happened, you know? If you were in some way, shape, or form talking about something that happened to you truthfully, and how they might really feel. You want to be looking to the left, upper left. You want to be looking down for your emotions to the down right area. So it's important to keep these things straight because if you don't keep them straight, people will know that there's either something wrong or you're duping them. So anyway, that pretty much wraps it up for my uh, terribly written speech. Any questions? One, yes. Um, no, I actually wouldn't recommend any good books because that would be biased on my part. Can you recommend any good books? I personally think that I'm not qualified to recommend books because I would mislead you. I'm just gonna, yeah, uh, no. However, I know you're qualified on this. Yeah, what books would you recommend? Could you, could you say that louder? All right. So any, any other questions at all? I believe what she was saying was specifically the two people that started NLP, correct? Where did she go? Okay. Books by Bandler or Grinder, correct? Yes, that's what I thought. Um, obviously, since they're the founders of it, but there are lots of subjective techniques that other people have come out with over the years, and they'll sell it to you. But ultimately, most of those courses are just money-grubbing capitalists trying to sell you something that's pretty obvious and easy to find out. Although, some people would disagree with this, and that's based solely on the fact that they spend a lot of money on these courses, and you never know. So anyway, that's that.